Hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous, over the top beautiful day here in the second collapse of civilization here in the Maya, the former middle of the Mayan civilization. We have now arrived in Chulha, X-U-L-H-A, I don't know what the, uh, probably Mayan for W-A-S-F is my guess if it was one of the later Mayan settlements. So uh, anyway, it is a gorgeous, it is a getting to be a Saturday evening. And uh, since I know I cannot find a margarita in Chulha, Mexico on a Saturday night, well, other than in the rich gringo hotels, uh, I am going to finally get around to this. I have uh, been holding on to this. All right, that's about all. We have a big, I don't know what that big old thing was. Don't tell me that my computer just did this again. Oh, I hope it's still, yeah. Okay, I've been having a lot of collapses of my computer. Uh, so I think I have already read, I know I've read one and maybe two of this fellow, Dr. Steve Genko, G-E-N-C-O, his seven-part uh, series, this is from Medium.com, of course, his seven-part series on the future of humanity, and this is the fifth and most distressing post in my seven-part series on the future of humanity. So, uh, Steve has a PhD in political science from Stanford, University and is the author of, weirdly enough, Intuitive Marketing in Neuro Marketing for Dummies. And this is uh, number five in the one that we've been waiting for. Now, it would probably take me over an hour to read this whole thing, and the internet's a little sketchy. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit here and blab for maybe half of it. Uh, we're going to part five of The Future of Humanity by Steve Jenko, The Coffin in the Room, Catastrophic Impacts on Human Population. I would wish he had made this The Catastrophic Impacts of Human Population, which he gets to in the second half. But he starts out with a little bit of good news, and that is the, you know, the, uh, the, the silver lining in the cloud of climate change. The catastrophic impacts on human population. Take it away, Steve. And I'm going to put the link on here. I highly suggest you go on and read this yourself in the full seven-part series because uh, I'm not going to have time to finish it, but we're going to do as much as we can here in a half hour. All right. <clears throat> there is a puzzling disconnect at the core of climate science between climate projections and population projections. Indeed, comparing the two, one might be forgiven for thinking that population scientists and climate scientists live in two completely different worlds. On the one hand, climate scientists foretell a world of unprecedented disasters over the next decades and centuries. Deadly heat, floods, droughts, megastorms, abandoned coastlines, fresh water scarcity, food shortages, etc., etc. But, on the other hand, population scientists at the UN are projecting a world population that continues to grow, largely driven by high birth rates in poor countries, those most vulnerable to climate impacts. In a report, one of these many reports from the UN, scientists projected that world population would rise to 9.7 billion by 2050 before leveling off 
at nearly 11 billion, around 2100. Now, all of these numbers are pulling numbers out of there, you know where, and Steve is going to explain why nobody knows, but it ain't going to be 11 billion people uh, in 2100. The disconnect between these two vision of, uh, visions of humanity's future is dizzying. To take one example, the UN estimates that the population of sub-Saharan Africa will double by 2050. Yet, the latest climate warnings from the IPCC tell us that a 2C hotter world by 2050 is both likely and likely to devastate sub-Saharan Africa, producing droughts, floods, food shortages, and regional warming so deadly that outdoor work there may become impossible for much of the year and much of the region. How can anyone expect population to double in such circumstances? The, the answer has to do with how the IPCC climate models are constructed. The climate models used in the IPCC reports only include population as an input variable, not as an output. I thought that was outtake variable, but anyway, he's calling it an out he's calling it an output variable. They predict climate change is based in part on a given level of population, usually taken from those UN projections, but they do not predict population changes based on a given level of global warming. In other words, the population and climate models are not bidirectionally coupled. And then he has, you know, he, uh, he footnotes all this where he got that information. So, the reason why climate models do not show population declines in the face of unprecedented global warming is because they don't include population as an output. Again, I thought it was outtake, but anyway, he's the, he's the uh, expert. They don't include population as an output variable in their models. If they did, they would probably find that the, these UN world and regional population projections are wildly over-optimistic for the hotter world we are entering. And that's, uh, I guess, I, I guess if you consider 11 billion people to be optimistic as compared to the 8 billion. Uh, anyway, be that as it may, the UN population projections are an all things being equal projection for a world in which all things are very, very far from being equal. When we look at all the interlocking elements that define the global predicament humanity faces today, what is the weakest link in the chain of climate change cause and effects? It is the human body. I, I came very close today to passing out, literally passing out from heat stroke. I mean, the, it, it was getting scary on the side of the road here in Mexico in February. Humans are a scrappy species, but our bodies have biological limits beyond which we cannot survive. We cannot survive in wet bulb temperatures greater than 35 C for more than a few hours. I had to be going right up against that today. Uh, we cannot survive without water for more than three days. We cannot survive without food for more than one to two months. Given these limitations on human survivability, 
what are we to make of warnings like these from the 2022 IPCC's sixth assessment report? Okay, approximately 3.3 .3 to 3.6 billion people live in areas that are highly vulnerable to climate change. That is close to half of all humans alive today. Global hotspots of high human vulnerability are found particularly in West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, South Asia, Central America. I am about uh, 10 miles from the border of Central America, South America, blah, blah, blah. Future human vulnerability will be concentrated where their capacities of governments, communities, and the private sector are least able to provide infrastructures and basic services. Um, risk or highest where species and people exist close to their upper, their upper thermal limits along coastlines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, good lord, this goes on and on. I, I'm going to be, I'm just going to skip through a lot of this. You really should read this whole thing, but I want to get to some of the uh, the impacts of, not just the impacts on uh, climate change will increasingly put pressure on food production. Global warming will progressively weaken soil health and ecosystems such as pollinators at 3C in the long term areas exposed to climate related hazards will expand substantially compared with a 2C or lower. Okay, so boil this all down, Steve. What the IPCC is saying in polite but unambiguous language is that the impacts of climate change on human bodies are going to be felt first and most severely by the most vulnerable among us, such as a stupid gringo walking down a hot road barefooted uh, in Mexico. This is where the deadly heat will be felt first, where the famines will first appear, and where the droughts, floods, and ecosystem collapse will be the most devastating. It simply seems implausible that already struggling regional populations will grow as projected by the UN under the burden of two to four C higher average global temperatures. Because of the disconnect between climate models and population projections, we don't have a clear picture of exactly how devastating to human populations different levels of global warming will be. Perhaps this has been an intentional strategy by climate scientists to avoid spooking their audiences, but it has left us with a big gap in our understanding of the single most important consequence of climate change if you are a human. And that would be its effect on human mortality. Without plausible data and models to guide us, that gap gets filled by, filled by speculation and get guesswork and a lot more heat than light. Okay, so we're going to start changing a little bit from on to of. Now we get into the more interesting conversation to me. Climate science and carrying capacity. What is a, quote, sustainable world population? Well, everyone knows uh, my uh, definition of a sustainable world population carrying capacity for humans is zero. But anyway, what does Steve have to say about this? 
climate scientists' opinions on population tend to fall into two camps. The first, I would call the, I'm not going to touch that camp. These folks appear to be quite happy to keep population impacts out of their climate models. Their job, they might argue, is to provide data and models to help humanity avoid the worst population consequences of climate change, not to document the magnitude of devastation we can expect if we fail in that mission. Fair enough. Uh, then I'm going to jump ahead. I'm, I'm, uh, again, guys, it would take me well over an hour to read this. Uh, the second camp of climate scientists might be called the carrying capacity camp. The concept of carrying capacity has been a staple of ecological studies for decades. It refers to the maximum population size a biological species can sustain within its environment given the food, habitat, water, and other resources available in that environment. Its, ac its application to human populations has been controversial. Critics point out that humans, unlike other species, can alter their environments thus increasing their local, regional, or global carrying capacity. Otherwise, turn up the air conditioning. Both the Industrial Revolution and the Green Revolution are often cited, you know, by the apocalyptimist as proof that human carrying capacity on planet Earth can be vastly increased through innovation and the exploitation of untapped energy sources. Yes, humans also differ from other species in that we know how to capture and store resources for later use on an industrial scale, thus effectively delaying any impacts of exceeding carrying capacity by drawing upon stored resources until they are depleted. Proponents of the carrying capacity concept acknowledge that humans have successfully increased the planet's human carrying capacity many times over, but warn that this does not mean carrying capacity, capacity is infinitely expandable or that energy sources are infinitely renewable. Rather, they argue that whatever energy sources or technology innovations the human population might enjoy, that population's environment imposes a finite carrying capacity. The number of individuals whose lives the current resource base can support either at bare subsistence level or preferably at a higher level of life satisfaction, health, and well-being. The thing about carrying capacity is that as long as populations remain well below an environment's capacity to support it, the concept is of little interest or value. But given now that we are on the hockey stick portion of the global population curve, the idea of revisiting carrying capacity is gaining momentum among climate scientists. Indeed, in a world in which global population has doubled from 4 billion to 8 billion in 50 years, the question of whether and for how long the planet's natural environment can meet the survival needs of such an exploding population can no longer be avoided. Human population has been growing exponentially, but resources are growing at best linearly and at worst, not at all. 
And then, guys, uh, he goes, uh, he, he gets in to, uh, you, you know, I, I mean, I could make this one, I, you know, it, it makes me wonder how many people on the planet, this man has less than 500 followers. This guy, his, I mean, this is one of seven parts about the future of humanity, and it appears that less than 500 people on this planet have bothered to read one word that Steve Jenko has written. I anyway, guys, this just... Uh... Anyway, so he breaks all of, a lot of this research down. I interpret this as a rather obliquely expressed warning. Seven billion people might be able to live miserable, subsistence-leveled lives within the planetary boundaries that will protect us from a two to four sea hotter world, but for that many people to live a good life, our profligate consumption of the world's resources, including but not limited fossil fuels, would have to be radically reduced either by getting two to six times more use through efficiency out of each unit of resource consumed, or failing that by having only one-half to one-sixth as many people equitably consuming the resource currently being consumed very unequally by 8 billion people. According to this formulation, we'll call it the Steve Jenko formulation, according to this formulation, the Earth only contains enough finite resources to support a good life for between 1.3 billion and 4 billion people. And then, uh, good for him, then uh, uh, he goes in and talks about my hero, William Reese, who you can find if you go to my uh, interviews. William Reese leads that off. Uh, William Reese uh, says, Quote, the long-term human carrying capacity of Earth after ecosystems have recovered from the current plague is probably one to three billion people, depending on technology and material standards of living. Paul Ehrlich, uh, who I have also interviewed here, you can find his interview, he was the first video ever on Collapse Chronicles. Uh, Eric and Ehrlich and his co-authors conclude that optimum population might vary significantly given different values and policies, but overall is likely to fall somewhere between one and a half billion and two billion people. Um, Johann Rockström, one of the founders of the Planetary Boundaries approach, stated in a 2019 interview that in a 4C warmer world, quote, it's difficult to see how we could accommodate 8 billion people or maybe even half of that there will be a rich minority of people who survive with modern lifestyles, no doubt, but it will be a turbulent, conflict-ridden world. Um, uh, Rockstrom was essentially echoing his colleague Hans Joachim Schellenhuber a leading climate scientist and advisor to the German government who said, told the New York Times, quote, in a very cynical way, 
it's a triumph for science because at last we have stabilized something, namely the estimates for the carrying capacity of the planet, namely below one billion people. Uh, this statement, basically an offhand joke gone bad, was met with significant backlash. I bet it was. Uh, anyway, uh, good Lord, so this is going on and on. Uh, obviously, population decline via decreasing birth rates would be far preferable to population decline via increasing death rates. As population scientists and clueless morons are quick to point out, birth rates are falling in many wealthy countries. In some cases, to levels low enough to produce population declines over the next several decades, but at least today these declines are more than compensated for globally by high birth rates in many of the most climate vulnerable and economically fragile countries of the less developed South. And uh, good Lord. Uh, some of his, uh, it seems highly unlikely, don't you be knocking, I, 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 don't you, come here, don't you be, don't you be knocking over my camera, you're going to be knocking over my camera like that, are you looking for a pork chop or what, you're saying, I'm looking for a pork chop, I smell the pork chops cooking, um, it seems highly unlikely that rich nations of the world are going to voluntarily reduce their consumption of the world's resources, both non-renewable and renewable, by 70%. Do you think so? And I guess his last chapter, let me go ahead and get through the last chapter, Summing it up, and I skipped over a lot, sum it up, Steve Jenko, a population disaster is in the making. To bring it all together, humanity appears to have missed its chance to mount a voluntary response to the climate change resource depletion predicament in our faces. It could have listened to the science. It could have accepted the need for a significant shift in consumption in the wealthiest countries. It could have put together a global plan and made the necessary massive investments to achieve an orderly transition from fossil fuels to a modern, global, renewable energy infrastructure. It could have addressed the massive inequalities that exist both within and between countries. Humanity has had the means to do all these things for at least half a century, but we have done none of them for reasons that are now all too familiar. Greed, selfishness, short-sightedness, political obstruction, and good old inertia. The potential for catastrophic loss of human life due to climate change is indeed the coffin in the room, but it continues to be ignored, denied, or diminished. Climate scientists have firmly established that more people consume more resources, burn more fossil fuels, produce more greenhouse gases, raise global temperatures, and increase the risk of irreversible climate tipping points. But they have been more reticent to document and publicize how severely global warming might 
in turn decimate populations around the world starting with the regions that will initially experience the full brunt of a 2 to 4 C hotter world but spreading quickly to the rest of the world as well. The effects of climate change on vulnerable nations and regions will not remain local given the dependence of our modern global economy on regional specialization and international trade these initial regionally focused climate change disruptions and disasters will click will quickly produce global ripple effects shrinking the supplies of imported energy materials products and food upon which many of the wealthiest nations depend and that is when the rich North's involuntary transition to a world without oil will really begin to be continued in part six and seven but I need to wrap this up uh, because uh, I think my buddy has got those fossil fuels to work and uh, I'm hoping we're having some uh, pork chops and macaroni and cheese here during the second collapse of civilization in the Mayan heartland. Bye guys.